Hi, I'm Christopher. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to the Cabin Boy Knits Woolcast. This episode, we've got a lot to cover. Spring is finally here. Yes, we finally have some warmer weather, something to look forward to. I think we deserve it. We've had a long winter and I think we deserve the warm weather finally. And you know, the plants have been probably around three weeks behind and I've been aching to get at my hands at some of these plants to start dying with them. So I'm glad that the warm weather's here and things have started to pop. We're gonna cover what life's been like at the cabin over the last couple months. And we're gonna talk about our new relationship with the Netherlands, which is really exciting. I'll be talking about a book. We'll talk about uh, finished objects and works in progress. And what are you gonna cover? Well, we're going to talk about the lilacs, uh, the dandelions, and rhubarb. Awesome. So grab your favorite drink, sit back, and we'll tell you our story. So you'll notice that there's a new person sitting at the table, and that is Jamie. Jamie's an important part of Cabin Boy Knits and my partner, and I thought it was important and interesting to get your perspective on what's been going on at the cabin, and you do so much around here. I wanted to talk about that as well and shed some light. But the viewers don't know much about you, most of the viewers, and so I didn't tell you this beforehand, but... Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions and hopefully by answering the questions and the an answers that you give, people will get a better understanding of who you are. Are okay. you doing it? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. The first one is, you said your name's Jamie. However, I have heard people call you Jamie, the other the guy. The other guy. What's that yes. all about? Well, I think it's because, um, I seem to be always around. We've traveled enough to a lot of the different fiber festivals. We see a lot of the same people and, and I'm just the other guy. I guess it started with maybe Linda and Sophie, yeah. who it's like, oh, that's the other guy. So I'm, yeah, the other guy. Yeah, so you're hashtag the other guy when you when you in, in all the photos, and you don't have an Instagram account. I think that was part of it because you're you're That's anti right. Instagram. So, That's right. so because you didn't have an Instagram photo, you were the other guy. That's the only way they could tag you. So it's quite fine. And that yes. name is stuck. Yes. Okay. We're gonna so, keep it. So where were you born? Where was I born? I was born in Sudbury, Ontario. But where's the, that? Like for people who don't aren't familiar with this area. Sudbury is. In northern Ontario, which is about four hours north of Toronto. Okay, awesome. And so, your family, Canada is made up of immigrants, basically. People who have moved here yes. at various times. So, what about your experience or your family's experience? Where are they from? Well, I would almost not even consider myself an immigrant, per se, other than... You know, French Canadians, I'd have to say the French were the first to arrive, possibly into Canada. I'd like to think so. And, uh, you know, them mating with the indigenous peoples of Canada. And we have the Métis, French Canadian, which is okay. well, heritage. Okay, I would say that, <laughs> in terms of Canadian history, I would say the French Canadians definitely were probably the first to establish a community of any length of time. If okay. we ignore the Vikings. Okay, yes. Okay. Okay, so <laughs> so my heritage goes way back. It goes way back. Yes. So you said uh, French Canadian strong. Like it goes way back. Like you, you guys were. Yeah, I, I I know that I have a cousin who's done a bit of history on our family roots on my mother grandmother's side, and we uh, could dig, go back to the sixteen hundreds. Um, you know, first arriving from Prussia into Canada, southern southern part of Quebec, and then you know it's traditionally the the um, the men who married the farmers' daughters, and from there they moved into Ontario, Upper Lower Canada, and yeah. here we are. When I say that the Vikings were the first ones here, I'm talking looking at it from a European perspective. But when we look at the indigenous people, they were here long before, long before that. So, um, so your roots have been going way back, a lot farther than mine. I would say so. <laughs> uh, okay. City mouse, country mouse, which one are you? 
I don't this know. This would be a really interesting answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say, well, I don't want to. I don't want to date myself here, but think Green Acres. It's like I neither. Because I, I did like the city when I was new to the city, but after spending 20 or so years in, the, in a big city, then, you know, back to, my, back to my small town. But a small town would be Sudbury, and I'm not loving that kind of a small town feel. But being in the country all of a sudden, I like the quiet peacefulness of, of the countryside at the cabin. Okay. People who know you say that you're a great cook. What is your favorite thing to cook? Well... I just consider myself an average cook. Old-fashioned recipes, you know, my mother's recipes, grandmother's recipes, and I just like to make good old-fashioned good food and a eat it. Anything in particular? Cake. Cake. <laughs> Cake is my favorite food group. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. You've had all kinds of different jobs. What was your favorite job? Oh my gosh, different jobs. Uh, my favorite job? Well, I have to say my, well, my easiest job maybe? When I worked in Toronto as a spokesperson and, uh, yeah, commercial sort of special events spokesperson. Okay, good. And favorite festival? You've been to a bunch of knitting festivals now, so what are some of your favorites? Well, I can't say favorite. They've all been new to me, so they've all been great and exciting and fun. But, I mean, Fanu. I had heard about Fano. You had been in there a couple of times off the coast of Copenhagen. Um, that was incredible. I mean, sand dunes, the history. It's also a World Heritage Island. The whole island is World Heritage. I um, met some wonderful people. And then I would have to say my first time at Vogue. Um, that was amazing. Vogue, New York. Um, what else? What about in Canada? Anything in Canada? Canadian festivals. Twist, of course. That's one of the biggest Canadian ones I've been to. I love where it's located. The countryside, we were very, you were teaching there. We were welcomed there. Um, great little historical town. And the organizers, people there, Amelie Blanchard, wonderful people. Excellent. That leads me to the last question, and that is, you're, I would say you're relatively new to the fiber world and to, the, to that whole group. So what is your view of the fiber community and, and what are some of the highlights for you? Well, first of all, when Christopher and I first met and he had, was leaving to go on a men's knitting retreat and I thought, okay, men who knit, great. Um, little hobby on the side. Um, and then, as I mentioned, when went to Fanu for the first time and they get, you know, something like 10,000 knitters and fiber people who, who go to the festival, I thought, okay, let me think about this for a minute. 10,000 people make their way to a knitting festival. Okay, something's happening in the world that I'm not aware of, and here I am, thrown into it, and I, I've grown to, I enjoy it, I love it. Oh, excellent, good. Um, we also met a lot of people. We I have think. met a lot of people. Yeah. Yes, I have to say that's one of the great things, because, you know, uh, my first time to some of these festivals, and people I've met here in Canada first, and I could be somewhere halfway around the world, or, you know, just down in the U.S., million miles away as well it seems like from the cabin when we drive and all of a sudden hey there's Amelie there's Sophie there's Linda there's you know Brooklyn Boy Ditz there's all, all kinds of people that I met on this side of the uh, the border and then I'm meeting down everywhere else I go we run into each other and it's been pretty incredible yeah yeah I mean the knitting community is fantastic and the fiber community the crochet community the whole the whole group is, is is amazing okay I mentioned a lot of stuff is going on at the cabin. Uh, springtime is a fantastic time to be here. I love every season, really, but spring is, 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 is somewhat magical. What's been going on here? What's been exciting you? <laughs> well, let's see. Uh, the countryside, I'd have to say, uh, it's springtime. Wildlife, reproducing. Um, new this year, we have little foxes. We have a fox, a little vixen, underneath the uh, back deck. And the dog uh, goes crazy whenever it's out. Crazy. He hears it before we do. We wake up in the morning and you look out the window and this vixen has, uh, you know, we look and thought, four little kits. Oh, no, they're five little, no, they're six little kits. Kits, I think they're what they're called. I call them puppies because you look out the window and you see these little pups, puppies running all over the back, the backyard. And then we have the deer and the rabbits. Uh, 
The deer are curious because it's funny. You, you look out the window and you think, I, I feel like somebody's looking at me through the window. And you look out and you see these, you know, four or five deer, a little fawn out the window. And they're real cute. They're chewing on the grass and uh, munching away. And then I look again and I see that, uh, you know, all of our uh, trees are in bloom. Our fruit trees, peach trees, plum trees, cherry trees. And there they are eating the flowers and the buds. And I'm thinking, not so cute because my peaches I need to make my Jamie Jam, peach jam, like I made last year. So yeah, not so cute. But you're not the only benefactor of the peaches. <laughs> last year, <laughs> Zan, uh, our dog, he was able to, he figured out how to get the peaches. He stood on his hind legs, had his two front paws on the tree and he was shaking the tree and the peaches were falling down. Yeah. <laughs> he was eating the peaches. Grabbed, so yeah. you have to worry about the, the deer in the spring and the dog <laughs> when, yeah. At the end of the summer. Right, he'll grab hold of one of the lower branches with the cheeks and he tugs at the, at the lower branch as well when the peaches fall and he just munches on peaches all day long. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things I find interesting though is, and a lot of people are surprised that we have peaches. And I, d I definitely think we're in a microclimate in, in this particular area because we are pretty far north and um, you hear about peaches coming out of the Niagara region, but not usually as far as north as we are. So I was, I was shocked the first time that we saw peaches come off the tree. Well, yeah, because... I, I just pruned back those trees just randomly a couple of years ago and then the following season all of a sudden all of these trees were blossoming flowers and we had no idea what they were and then yeah we discovered it were peaches, plums, there were yellow plums, red plums, blackberries and cherries. Yeah. Most yeah. of the birds eat the cherries and speaking of birds, birds, <laughs> we've seen a lot of birds because all these new birds like to feed off those fruit as well and not only the fruit but Christopher has been dying yarn with some of the springtime plants, right? And hanging them out on the line to dry. And, you know, lo and behold, you look out the window and it's, oh my gosh, look at that little warbler. And the, these birds, but they're, they're, they're plucking away at the yarn. The chickadees love the yarn. So <laughs> they, they probably have, we probably have the best nests anywhere. Yes. It's got cashmere and silk. And I've been keeping, I've been keeping track. I've been I've been making notes because the morning doves I've noticed they really love the BFL because it's got that <laughs> silk in it. And then, Why wouldn't they? And then the cashmere I'd say with the warblers and then the blue jays and the robins they just go after something a little more you know the merino and so yeah they're living in in style and luxury nests I'd yeah. say. Yeah, and we saw one of the when I went to fix the roof, um, I was climbing up the ladder and I saw a nest and there were four eggs or there was four or five eggs in it. And I think it was a morning dove nest. And the, it was a pretty nice nest. <laughs> so it's, it was. There so were, the birds the birds are one of the benefactors as well of, were, of the yarn. Did you post that, didn't you? Because there were fluffy fl fibers and I know it's part of his, his wool that I'm glad it's created a home for, a shelter and a home for the yes. wildlife. Yes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then dandelions, we've had dandelions pop up Yes, dandelions, and that's something that you're going to be talking about because you're going to be doing some dyeing. But I also came up with a, a recipe that you could drink, dandelion, which I've made right here. Ooh. Dandelion. Well, can you see the dandelions and fresh mint from the garden? And Christopher is going to try it because... <laughs> um, he's always the tester of these things because he likes it more than I do, I'm sure. Thank you. So before I try it, uh, the last episode I recorded was a how-to and, and what to do with dandelions. And we talked about the history of dandelions and the med medicinal quality and whatnot. But I, you know what I didn't cover? I didn't cover the French name for dandelions. Well, that's right, because dandelion is actually uh, Dent de Lyon, which originates from France. And I think that the plant... One of the theories is the plant came over on the Mayflower in maybe a medicinal box, like with one of the m medical kits that may have come in those early days. But uh, Dent de Lyon, which translates to lion's tooth, so it's known as lion's tooth. It's also known as uh, laitue de chien, which is dog's lettuce. Mm -hmm. And one of the favorite names, one that I know it as, is pisson lit, which the British say pish in bed, which... <laughs> that we know, peace on e is piss in bed. Which okay, so if I drink this, am I going to piss in bed? Is that okay? <laughs> well, the thing is, is it, it, it is known as a diuretic, so it does increase your your urination uh, activity, which in turn, you know, your odds of wetting the bed. And so that's why you gave me a full glass or two thirds full. I think in moderation, I'll be fine. Mm. 
Mm, it's good. It's got an earthy flavor to it. It has a sweet flavor. You know what I was expecting? I was expecting more of a bitter flavor. So, and so there wasn't uh, there wasn't the bitter bite to it that I was expecting. Well, you do add, you know, a hint of honey along with the mint leaves, the fresh yeah. mint. So that's probably cuts the bitterness somewhat. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. But the other thing is um, with the roots. Uh, you can take the roots of the dandelion and make a coffee-like substance. And so I did that early in the spring. And I usually, it, I only did it because I was excited to get my hands on it. But I usually wait and harvest the roots in the fall. And I did notice I didn't roast the um, the roots long enough. And there was that bitter taste. So that's what I was expecting with this. But there wasn't a bitter taste here. So it was great. So yeah. Good, good job. And one of the recipes you can do, I mean, you talked about you grind it, you grind the roots mostly in the fall, but we'll, we'll try that come the fall because you can make dandelion chai lattes. Mm, that'd mm. be good too. It'd be really good. Yeah. So the, the dyeing that I did with, with the dandelions, like when we, when we see a patch of dandelions, we divvy, divvy it up. He gets some for cooking and I get some for dyeing. And it, the dye comes out quite nicely and it's, it's very simple to do. So if you haven't seen the video, go check that out. Uh, and it's a how-to again on, on how to dye with dandelions. But here's the end product. So, and the, one of the things I love about this is that it doesn't take a lot of water when you're, when you're doing it. And, and so sometimes when we're dyeing yarn, it takes a lot of water to clean it, but this stuff doesn't, uh, dandelion comes right out, so it's fantastic. So this one is merino, and this one is a mixture of Canadian, Canadian fiber. And you see how they take the colors differently. Both both are really nice. This one has more of a green hue to it, yeah, I would it say. Yeah, it does a bit. And this one almost looks like, uh, what do you call that? Your yellow highlighter. Yeah, yeah, I would I would think so. Yeah. It's pretty bright. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. I, I like both of them. So that's, that's dandelion. So the next thing I want to talk about was a new relationship with the Netherlands. Yeah, you've been getting mail. I mean, we haven't been out of the house, but, you know, it's pretty exciting when you get something from the outside world, mail or package. And it all, I think it all started with an exchange on Instagram. Uh, Sarah Jane, so Atelier Sarah Jane in the Netherlands, she has Texel sheep, or she, she had a photo and she'd mentioned Texel sheep. And so I had to check that out. And then um, I sent her a note and said, I love, love the work that you're doing because she, she's a natural dyer. And she also makes beautiful things, and she works a lot with uh, sheep that are uh, indigenous to the Netherlands. And the Texel sheep come from tech, from the island um, right off of uh, the Netherlands. And so um, Texel sheep first, when you go back into records, they've got records going back to the 1800s uh, for Texel sheep. And it was what's really interesting about this breed is that they've spread all over the world now and part of the reason is because the meat uh, of, the, of the sheep is is quite lean and so uh, and and so a lot of people really like that and it's been only recently that people are really um, embracing the wool and the wool is about um, it's around 30 microns and it's got a really interesting um, texture to it it is uh, got an earthy feel to it. Uh, it's not scratchy though. When you think about 30 microns or plus, you might think it's scratchy, but this is really nice and it takes color quite nicely as well. So I like the uh, Texel sheep a lot. Uh, in Canada, we started importing Texel sheep in, around 1980s. And in the US, it was in the late 80s, early 90s. And so in Canada, there's a lot of farms now that carry Texel sheep. So she's, she did a great job dying. And then she also was kind enough to um, send a Wensleydale um, skein as well. And that is a wonderful yeah, color. Feel that. Yeah, yeah that the color is fantastic and Wensleydale is so nice. It just sucks up color beautifully. So, did, you, did you manage to get her trade secret on this one? No, of course not. Um, but I would say that uh, I would highly recommend, I would put a link to uh, Atelier uh, Sarah Jane uh, in the notes. Uh, but check out her website. She's got a lot of interesting things and super nice person as well. So that is the Netherlands, the connection with the Netherlands. The next one is, I've talked about this book. Mm -hmm. This is Laverne Benton's book. And we picked this up uh, when we were in New York at yes. Vogue Knitting Live. And I liked it because when you go to a yarn festival, you don't see many dudes on cover of anything. So I, I thought that that was great to see. Um, on the cover. So I thought, you know, we're, we're preparing for a bunch of festivals coming up this year and we were supposed to be at Knit City and Twist and PEI and so I thought 
uh, I wonder if Laverne would be interested in partnering with me. Um, and partnering by meaning she does all the graphics and whatnot, and I would just ask her if she would be able to tweak or um, put something in the image of Kevin Boynton. So we worked together on that. Uh, she's very talented and, and incredible person. So Laverne Busy Peach uh, came up and created this. And it's Kevin Boynton. And I love it. I think it's great. So we had, yes. we had these, and it looks just like you. Well, no, I, I'm the other. Well, if you look closely, the other guy is just back here behind the tree. Jeez. I think he's sleeping. I'm behind the back. He's page. sleeping. Oh no, you're inside. The, you're inside the cabin. That's right, in the kitchen. So, cooking dinner. With so, the plants. With the plants. Yeah. So anyway, this is. Um, I think she did a fantastic job. I would. Um, Highly encourage you to reach out to Busy Peach as well. She's fantastic. And I'll put her contact information there. And also but my question was it arrived. I thought I thought, well, that's great. Can I have one? Because I thought, you know, notepad, it's something to just jot down some notes, take it around with you here and there and everywhere and until I opened it up and I didn't understand most of what's inside. <laughs> yeah, well it's for it's for people who knit or crochet. And so they have crochet hooks, needle hooks. What I like about it, it also has um, the metric system and the imperial system. Um, so it's got, it's got both of those. And so what what you can do is you can take this along with you in your knitting bag. And if you've got a project on the go, you can write down particulars on the project and um, it's great. So really, really like this. And um, thank you so much Laverne for, for producing this. It's, it's a very, very happy. Okay, so now we're going to talk about works in progress or whips. Did you okay. know what a whip is? No. It's a works work in, in progress. progress. <laughs> yes. So, anyway, works in progress, not baking things, but we're, we're talking now about fiber stuff. Yes. Usually. So, and I know you've been um, doing some fiber stuff. Well, I do a little. <laughs> Am I being generous? Well, I do. Okay, so this this was my work in was my work in progress. Now, it's a cowl. And I knitted it, and it was going to be for Christopher's sister's birthday using Christopher's naturally dyed wool, of course, partial. Um, it's it's a Canadian wool. It's dyed with, last year you did it with lilacs and indigo, I believe. Yeah. And so um, my knitting skills, I, I didn't actually give it to his sister. Um, first, it wasn't finished, but then I miscalculated the dimensions and I realized it's turned into more of a tube top <laughs> and as you could see it fits wonderfully as a tube top but I don't think it would be age appropriate or something that his sister would wear so so what are you gonna do with it it's called deconstructing deconstructing the yeah. cowl yeah. and so gauge is very gonna, important we're gonna reuse <laughs> that beautiful wool we'll do a workshop on gauge next time <laughs> sounds like a plan so uh, my my whip is the last episode I talked about socks and I'm still on the sock kick. Uh, I'm still tinkering around with it. I didn't really, it wasn't the sock that I wanted to show you as much as the yarn, this color in particular. So this yarn is um, Briggs and Little yarn that I dyed and I dyed it with dandelion. And so what I did was I actually took the um, the indigo and I reduced the the amount of indigo in my dye bath and had a very and, and only one dip in a very quick dip in my indigo that and um so it was a very light blue and then i dyed it in dandelion and i love the color of this it's a it's a really nice green i'm not sure if the camera is picking up the color or not but it's it's uh yeah that that almost looks like almost like a pistachio type green. Yeah, it's a green, you, it's a green you've yeah. not had before, but it looks like something I would eat on an ice cream cone. Yes. I don't eat pistachios, but you do. I know he doesn't eat pistachios. That's why I mentioned pistachio. But it does look, it like, does look like, pistachio. like pistachio ice cream. I do like the flavor of pistachio, but I don't eat it. Um, and so I thought it would be, it would look great with um, a brown dye and it would be like chocolate mint. And yeah. so that's what, that's what I'm doing right now. I think I'm pretty happy also with the pattern, the final pattern for the sock. And so 
um, I'm just going to tinker around with the, the top part because I'm not. You said that you like this. I don't. Yeah, I did. I'm not sure if I'm sold on it yet. Um, so we'll see. But the purpose of the sock was that, to have it nice and thick and on your feet. Cause yeah, you sometimes it's cold on the floor at the cabin. Well, that's what I think because I think it looks very, very woolly, rustic. You could really see the. Um, I don't know. What do, what do you call that? The. You could really see the fiber, and the constitution of the fiber I would say. Okay. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me though also of the ho my hockey socks when I was uh, playing hockey. Well that's and what I like about it. It's very rustic. It's not like a refined dress sock. It's It serves its purpose and it looks fantastic with this wool. But the hockey socks that I had you had to hold up with garters. And this holds up on its own. Yeah. You wear the garters. I don't wear the garters with no, this. He no. doesn't wear the garters. No. So, so that's it. That's That's the work in progress. So finished objects. Finished objects. You go first. Okay. I do have one finished object and it's not a springtime ob object, but Christopher had produced one of these. It's the Prince Archie hat and I had to have one and I wanted one. And so I copied his pattern. And um, I'm very proud of it because I don't think I made any errors. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and it's using this fantastic yellow, which was your onion. Um, and this is like a goblin. So this was your wool with the onion dye. And then my first pom-poms, I just sort of, I just, I don't even know. I just did them. I just made them. Um, and I think it looks very bear-like and very, so that's my finished product. I would say that the finished project, the, when I had my hat, and I held it up beside your hat. Your hat was technically better than mine. And, um, well, yeah, <laughs> because I don't think I'm you know at this because you frog a lot. Um, what does frog mean? And so when you rip it, when you're ripping it out, like you were very precise at everything you were doing and, uh, you, were, and you were redo. I'm not doing well, I don't like doing stuff twice, so I'm gonna just be meticulous from the get-go because I don't like and and so and, and your tension everything in the hat is is fantastic and your pom-poms so I made my pom-poms um, I was very happy with them and then I saw your pom-poms <laughs> and I liked your pom-poms better <laughs> and, and the thing about and he taught me a little a little bit about tension because um, as I mentioned you know the the, the gift that was going to be for his sister my very first my very first cowl that I was knitted for your sister turned turned into a hat because <laughs> I guess I was so tense like this and the hat ended up standing on its own like this big um, and so I turned it into a very stiff hat yeah. and to recreate that pattern I think would be impossible because I don't want to go through what I was going through and I had all that stress stress and tension. Okay so this is your finished object so you have to wear it. Well I'm going to let you wear it. How come you're not going to wear it? <laughs> Do you know how much time I spent on this hair? <laughs> okay so here's the deal. I will wear yours if you wear my finished object. Sure. Okay. Okay. So my finished object, I was trying to remember where I picked this up, and I think I either picked it up at Rhinebeck or uh, Vinny, um, Vogue Knitting Live, but I, I think it was Rhinebeck, and it was um, White Barn Farm. And so what attracted me to this was the the colors. These are all naturally dyed, and I'll hold this closer to the... And this is pandemonium, the pandemonium scarf. And I have, it's, well, I guess technically it's not a finished object because I haven't trimmed the bottom. I wasn't gonna trim, really trim the bottom, um, but I do have to make some, I do have to even it out a little bit. But I would say it's close enough to a finished object. And so, um, anyway, the, the colors are fantastic. I think she did a great job. And this is White Barn Farm. Um, so, are you gonna wear that? Yeah, sure, let's give it a go. Okay, and I'll put on your hat. Let's see. <laughs> that looks great. <laughs> Here, you want to have this piece out because that's... There. Oh. oh. There you go. So this is the lilacs are in this week. And uh, it's always a, a fun time, or an interesting time anyway, because you want to make sure that you enjoy the lilacs that are out in your garden uh, before you mm -hmm. take them and, and die with them. And, and what I do with the lilacs is I die with the um, the flower and the leaves. 
and uh, the bark as well. Uh, you get different colors from each. So um, I always feel a little bit guilty taking the cutting the lilacs up, but you want to get them when they're at their peak because yeah. it really brings it brings up the color. Well, they don't last that long anyway, so you may as well do something with them because yeah. they're there for such a short period of time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so what I'm going to do is uh, this week. I'll be doing a lot of lilac dyeing, and so on the next episode, I'll be showing you my lilac dyeing. I think I'll well, I think I'll also will be doing an instructional video on on that as well. And as well, you recently had a photo with your rhubarb, which we just recently oh yeah yeah picked yeah. And so, I have the bottom part of the rhubarb right here because you used the top to do. You plan on doing well. I, I've died with. I was dying with the uh, leaves of the of the rhubarb, and it, you know it's it's interesting. A little bit controversial in dying with the with the leaves because you can't eat the leaves in any large quantity because um, you'll get very sick and you could possibly die if you ate them again in it's huge huge quantities. Time. What you can do is you can boil them, and you can take the um, the dye bath, and you can make um, in basically a repellent for insects on, on plants, and you can spray that on your plants, uh, plants that you're not going to consume. Uh, but I dyed with it just because I like the color of it, and it also acts as a mordant, so you can use that. And so the, the amount of quality, the, the amount that is on your yarn is not anywhere near uh, where it would cause, cause, cause any problems. There's also um, medicinal qualities to any like anything thing some of the a lot of the plants that are poisonous also have some medicinal qualities to them as well mm -hmm. um if used in moderation in the way that you're using them so um i'm not going to be doing a lot with the rhubarb leaves but i do like to to you can again use them as mordants and they're I, the color that comes out of them is really interesting but i'll save that for next week well i think the fact that you're going to use it for a, a, a mordant or for a bug repellent i don't think i'd be ingesting those leaves at all, in any which way. Oh, well, I'm not eating them either. But we're going to eat something else, <laughs> and that's going to be the rhubarb <laughs> stalks. The, the stalks of rhubarb. So I'm not sure, I've not ever, we haven't harvested the rhubarb before. Usually just, other than dying with it, we've done nothing. So I want to make something with this rhubarb. Now, I know a few people have already sent you a couple of recipes. Yes. Yeah, because we you took a photo of me holding the rhubarb with Zan. Zan was in the picture as well. Zan, our dog, is in a lot of pictures. He loves the camera. Um, and so I got a lot of feedback on the photo, and with it, a lot of recipes. Yeah, and I'm usually you know, the other guy behind the camera. Um, but this time, I'm going to try and make something special with the rhubarb. So I do, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to send along some recipes. Now, I love cake, so I was already kind of leaning towards a cake, but send me some sort of, I love traditional, old-fashioned, you know, grandma's recipe, or maybe your great aunt. Um, you know, a, a, a really home-baked, good something with rhubarb. That sounds good. Sounds delicious. So if you have any recipes, um, you can put them in comments on the on the YouTube channel or fire them off through uh, Instagram as well. We're happy to pick that up. Yeah, and I'm going to, I'll make something with it. I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to uh, make it and eat it and hopefully share it with you before it's all gone. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to, to having it as well. <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> so I just want to wish everybody a wonderful week. Uh, I enjoyed sharing our update with with the group, and enjoyed you sitting here, um, adding your two cents and and even more than that. So, uh, thank you very much thank for that, you. and we look forward to seeing you next week. So, take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye bye. Okay, so what's up for this week? What's up for this week? Well... Yeah. Okay, so that's
Good. I think it was good. Yeah.